Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Rafi. I'm from Sears. I'm one of the uh, commercial guys who's responsible for all things Google. Uh, as a Google partner and reseller. Um, so if you want to find out more about Google for Startups, just to add on to what uh, Lawrence was saying, there's about $200,000 worth of credits that's available if you are instit institutionally funded up to Series A. And if you have been in Series A and you have received funding, you will qualify as long as you haven't been in Series A for longer than 12 months. So in short, the reason why we know quite a bit about Google and Google programs, including Google for Startup programs, is that we have been a Google partner and reseller for the last 19 years of our existence. So we've been a long-time partner and global uh, managed services provider of Google. Then comes the question of why are we here sponsoring pizza? Um, we think that giving back to the community is great, but I have a personal agenda. As a commercial person with a big interest in Web3, I started out with blockchain way earlier than 2017. So uh, I've been in it for more than five years. Uh, my personal interest is that in the company that I work for, we have seen startups and unicorns. So there's been about 16 or 17 of them that we have seen grow from the time that they became our customers to the point that they had their IPOs and to the point where they have grown to the point that they are today. We would love to uncover the next unicorn. And that's the reason why I think Web3 is the place to look for, a strategic place to look for these unicorns. So if you guys are building something interesting in the Web3 space, if you guys want to figure out how to put a particular project on Google and how to make it work, if you want some kind of startup or credit funding for Google and you want to squeeze them for more credits, for example, uh, we are the guys who make that happen. So I hope you guys enjoy the food, you enjoy the drinks. Uh, people like Eugene from James Tech uh, is an example of a customer of ours. We really hope that they become, become the next unicorn. So I can add on one more to the list of accounts that we manage, 17 unicorns in total. So you have quite a number of topics, but the topics that they'll present today will be around how can we deploy a particular node on the cloud, or how can we make the node work on the cloud, for example. We don't claim to be Web3 people or Web3 experts at CS. We are infrastructure, Google Cloud experts, first and foremost. Uh, we help most of the Web3 projects like Manson, for example. Sorry, I didn't change the slide. So we, we have a lot of projects, for example, that Manson and Polygon migrate their, their workloads or their, uh, modernize their particular workloads and put them on Google Cloud. The end result is this question that a lot of our customers ask in the beginning of the journey. Why in the name of heavens should we work with you, or uh, should we work with CS? Well, um, in a nutshell, what we do is we help you get things done better, faster, and cheaper. So it's great that you have a platform like Google to work with, but you need a lot of help to make it work really, really well, and that's where we come in. So if there's any questions that you have about, you know, uh, Google Cloud, Google Cloud for startup credits, the $200,000 that I talked to you about, or if you have any questions about, you know, change tech, uh, just feel free to, to look for me. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening, enjoy the pizza, enjoy the drinks, and uh, hope you guys have a nice evening. Thank you for coming. Also, I'll take a moment to thank um, Lawrence from Google Developer Space for, for hosting us today. Yes. So, just to give a very quick introduction for our first speaker for this evening, uh, we will be having Bernard from eBuilders Project uh, coming to give us a talk on why are we doing this? What, what's so important about decentralization? Why does it matter? So, a little bit about Bernard. But, about Bernard, yeah. yeah. So, Bernard has been in the space for about six years. He's a pretty seasoned smart contract developer. He's interested in MEV and NFT projects. Yes. So if there's anybody who knows what he's doing, this is the guy. <laughs> here you go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Yeah, so uh, I'll be sharing the ethos of uh, decentralization and 101 reasons to have multiple endpoints. So can I have a show of hand who is interested to host a node? Oh, nice. Okay, I have some stickers to give out. I, I got it from DevCon. It's not from uh, Karen. Um, if you have a full node, um, raise your hand. Yeah, okay, I think you have it already. So, so it's, um, ah, Eugene. Thank My, you very much. Right, thank you. Yep, uh, a little bit uh, introduction for myself. Uh, I just, I, I graduated from NTU and, uh, and I'm a smart contract developer. So I'm a tech enthusiast and then I'm a part-time DJ. So 
I, I'm exploring Foundry and doing MEV on Flashbots SDK. So these are the six contents that I'll be going through today. So the first is system architecture and what is an RPC endpoint, and type of nodes, and uh, some personal experience with uh, having multiple endpoints, and solutions, conclusions. OK, so regarding system architecture, what are we trying to manage here? We are trying to manage data. What is data? So le let me give you an example of ancient centralized bookkeeping. So in the ancient days, there are this capital, there are faceting trades, and it is easy to uh, I mean, transact with um, coins and gold bars, etc. But if you have large amount of quantity, like for example, hundreds uh, of gold, and another person wants to trade with uh, hundreds ox, how do you facilitate these trades? So the capital. Um, a church come out with this idea of having a centralized order book. And um, they have broadcasters to um, record transactions um, by these two parties, for example, Peter and Mary. So what's the purpose of doing it? Anybody knows? OK, it's, just, it's to prevent them from um, doing double spending and uh, having disputes in the future. So the broadcasters will record the transactions and pass it to an elder um, priest to verify and uh, process it in the ledger. So that's the early days of centralized bookkeeping to ensure that the capital's trade flows well into different regions and uh, the country will prosper. So this is the verify, verifier um, who are trusted by the communities would review the ledger, and they would cross-check the information uh, by the uh, broadcasters. Uh, with, with, if there's any weakness uh, against the transactions, uh, any discrepancy, they will be investigated and uh, resolved. So fast forward to 21st century, we have a centralized architecture, which is um, Facebook or, or other big tech. So we will have a node that's doing um, client and server relationships. So the, the client will send a request, and then the server will respond. So it's a, a one-direction channel. So what's the problems and pros and cons with this architecture? First, it's very simple to implement, and it's very efficient. And it's easy to scale, scale up. For example, you run out of memories. You just need to add in an SSD on one server. That's about it. So to improve the security, um, because all data report will be passing through one port, will be easy to facilitate. However, it comes a cons in the centralized uh, architectures, because it is easy to fail if the one server goes down. So we need to have redundancy, right? That's where the centralized commits. So um, if, a, if a hacker decided to launch a DDoS attack, the centralized servers will go down, and most of the data transferred uh, will be lost. Um, yeah. And um, a centralized architecture is highly dependent on an infrastructure. So for example, you have an upgrade, so you have uh, a downtime. For example, you cannot transact or send a request during this certain period of time. So let's fast forward to the complex and modern blockchain decentralized architect. So the first um, consumer facing uh, software will be something like BitTorrent, where the early days uh, people will see certain music songs um, as the first applications. So, and then it becomes Bitcoin. So, um, it's a multi channel relationship. So, if you hold, uh, if you see the content and I, see, and, and I can uh, pull from you, and I'm also a seeder. So, that's where decentralized architecture comes in. So, in 
decentralization and decentralized architecture, uh, what we have is an enhanced fault tolerance. If one server goes down, and uh, there will be multiple other servers that will be there to serve you data that you want. So that's where um, why you need dif different mul multiple endpoints when you interact with decentralized applications. However, there's um, some cons in um, decentralized uh, architectures as well. Um, it's first, it's complex. It is hard to come up uh, with a consensus client and execution client. And second, it consumes a lot of um, resource because um, it requires more computational power and storage uh, because all the records are within um, the node. And lastly, uh, it, it is very slow to come up with a decision-making process, whether you want to upgrade or other things. So there you have it. Uh, as you can see, these are two comparisons between a centralized architecture and a decentralized architecture. Any questions? All good? Okay, so what is an RPC endpoint? Anybody? Uh, so according to Google, RPC is a protocol that one program can use to request a service from a program located in another computer on a network without having to understand the network details. So I can make an RPC request to a node and then the node will re return something back for me after they, they do some processing. So that's the purpose of RPC endpoint. So that's how um, a nodes communicate with one another. And in the ancient example will be the broadcaster where um, they relay transactions or relay message. So an endpoint is like a IP address with, with certain ports. So, you, so one node can come up with um, one endpoint. So if there are multiple nodes, then there are multiple endpoints to ensure that the systems are, rely, are resilient and um, there's, re there's always redundancy um, in the network. So what do a node do? So a node um, store data and um, reads, uh, I mean, allows users to query data like maybe views and a node accept transactions for example, Peter want to send to Tom, and Peter can invoke a function on a smart contract on the network. So a node can also do like a web socket um, subscribe to certain events. So for example, there's a swap on Uniswap. A node can always give you back these certain events. And lastly, a node um, will help to validate dates and uh, relay transactions on the Ethereum network. So what are different types of nodes? On the EVM network, we have the light nodes and full nodes and archival nodes. So we can see that um, archival nodes store the whole data from the beginning to the very end. But the full nodes only store the header from each checkpoint and the latest uh, 128 blocks. And for the snap syncs, they only store like the recent blocks and the last two headers. So um, you can do a simple things for like snap sync because like maybe query the balance from address. And for the full sync, uh, you can do much more. Um, they, can do, they can validate transactions as well. So you can run a validator nodes with full node and, and archival nodes. So where do we get all the RPC endpoints? So we can get from all these um, node provider so first off, we have the OG Infura, and then uh, AWS, Chainstack, and GetBlocks, and Poker Network, and Alchemy. Um, I use Alchemy like recently, so I feel that they, they are good. And uh, Morales is up and coming, and they provide some SDK as well. And yeah, there are a lot of node um, providers. And, Google, and last week, I found out that Google is um, launching their own um, net network service as well. So yeah, um, there are a lot of node provider 
for you to choose from. So uh, you can just sign up and explore different um, service provider. So um, some things to consider before you're signing up. So you, must, you, you might think that, um, why do you want this uh, certain service? Um, maybe it's for their mempool services, uh, for, or for their uh, archival nodes, so you can query the history in the chain, or you can use it for staking or MEV, or any other service that you think that you need. Or maybe they have multi-chains, like for example, you want to have um, Filecoin, and this morning I checked that chain stacks have a lot of um, support on the multi-chain, which is very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so for the price model, and um, usually they will give out free for the beginners and try different things out. And uh, for a developer, they usually charge 50 USD per month, so maybe there's cheaper plans out there, but I don't know. So for regarding speed, right, um, if you are closer to the node provider, you usually be faster. Lah. It's like a common thing, yeah. So for node services, right, so you can, uh, this is for like Samuel if you want, uh, later part where you will be running your own nodes, you can en enable, enable different services. And um, yeah, it's due to these flags uh, that you can en enable these services. So certain library requires um, different things. For example, MEV inspects, uh, inspect in Python. So what does this uh, library do? So it used um, to inspect the uh, mempool to find out um, different minor payments and uh, insights. But you cannot run it with GAF. Um, so this is some of the uh, interesting things that you might want to take note before you sign up for certain node providers. Yeah, so like if you want to particularly run this um, library, uh, then you have to get an Aragon uh, client. So these are, are the clients on the execution client on the mainnet. So usually um, they will be using God, Graph, yeah, and um, mostly they have uh, Ari ne never mind, and the third will be Aragon. So these are the top trees, and for the beacon chain, uh, we have Prism and Lighthouses. Prism is written in Go, and uh, Lighthouse is written in Rust. So, are you ready to run your node? <laughs> so let's uh, share one of my personal experience. So, I'm a smart contract dev, and I have to interact with the blockchain. So, first thing I would do, I have to check whether the, the place I have have internet, and then I'll check whether the deployer address is funded uh, with if so I can Right, I'll send some transaction on the net network. But something happens on that very day. Uh, Infura is down, and I couldn't connect to the blockchain. So that's where uh, the magic of blockchain comes in. I go to my usual hard hat, and I find out, um, I go to this column, and um, I change to another endpoint which connects to another node. Like, uh, for, for this case, it's Alchemy. I get this example from Infura. So voila, I'm able to connect back to the blockchain and uh, do my transactions. Okay, that's uh, my case. And I'll follow up with, um, to check whether the, the parameters are right before I deploy. Yep, um, and if you're a user, right, and you're using MetaMask, you can always uh, create a new endpoint uh, in, a, in the networks tab. And um, create another new name and uh, put in the endpoint. You get it from all the node providers, or you can host your own nodes. Yep. So, um, as a future developer, what are the solutions presented here? First, uh, later they will be uh, having two gentlemen up here uh, giving you the notes. Uh, that we will be sharing their front end tag and, and uh, Sammy will be going through the node setup. So if you decided to go with a node provider, um, these are the few things to take note. Like for example, you can set up an endpoint in few minutes and then um, you can work on your dApp easily. And uh, you don't have to worry about um, whether you set up this uh, endpoint correctly or not. 
So if you are smart contract dev, I would recommend um, Eugene. But um, Chainstack do provide um, additional service. This is what I found out when I look at the Block Routes um, website. So they have a um, partnership with Chainstack so that um, they can allow the transactions um, to go through them faster. And um, it is critical to have um, high speed with MEV because MEV is like a high frequency trading. Yeah, so every milliseconds is um, important. So um, the second way, which is uh, Sam DIY, DIY you know, at, at home or on cloud. So, um, so these are a few key points. It takes long hours to set up and high maintenance costs. You can either go crazy or you find something very meaningful and nice to learn. You, you, you get to understand how, uh, how, you, how to run the nodes and you can apply it in a different case. And the last two points is uh, very important. You, it's very flexible. You can add in other flags, any other services. For example, if you want to run an MEV boost, so you, you can add it on. And lastly, you don't have to be rate limit by uh, the node provider because you didn't upgrade your plans. So in conclusion, you must ask yourself, why do I want to have multiple endpoints? First, how much uh, of your net worth is on chain? <laughs> if the higher it is, um, the, the more you have to run multiple endpoints because you need to, need to be able to always have the connection to your assets. So for example, you want to send, it, send uh, other transactions or whatsoever. And um, second point is, um, if this network provider down, uh, goes down, can I use another endpoint to assess the blockchain so I can finish my business or deploy the contract or save my positions on, a, on, 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 on loan on chain? So um, lastly, do you need the flexibility to like run other software, like for example, MEV inspect? So it's more of your personal choice and journey. So by, dis by distributing resource across multiple nodes or participants, uh, decentralized network systems are more resilient to failure or attacks compared to centralized counterparts. This ensures uh, greater stability and reliability in the face of unexpected disruptions. With that, thank you. So I do have a poet, like if you guys want to scan, uh, you can look up for me. So I'll just drop you my poet. Yep. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Eugene, um, and I will talk about some cool things uh, on Web3 infrastructure. And this information is outdated, by the way, so three minutes was uh, with the previous version of our software, now it's 10 seconds. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty old news already for about three minutes. I will show you how to do it, that's it. Um, so what... Uh, yeah, indeed. We started Chainstack when we were building our own uh, blockchain application in 2017. And we tried to use Ethereum at that time. Um, it was pain in the ass because nothing worked. There were no tools. There was no infrastructure. There was no infure even. So we had to run our own nodes. They was broke. So we said, okay, somebody should fix this. And uh, we had to fix it, basically. Uh, so that's how we started Chainstack. Today, Chainstack is already a five-year-old company. Uh, we have some notable uh, customers and partners, like uh, some of those that are on the screen, you might know, like Chainlink, OneInch, CoinGecko, TrustWallet, Zapper, a bunch of others. So we basically uh, provide uh, the building blocks for uh, uh, all sorts of Web3 builders uh, across all sorts of tooling that they need to build their dApps. So our product portfolio includes uh, stuff like uh, blockchain nodes um, across 25 plus protocols, starting from Ethereum, Bitcoin, and with more, you know, recent ones like Aurora, Solana, Near, Polygon, ZKVM, Optimism, and a lot of other protocols. Uh, we have um, product 
called app chains, which is basically allowing you to deploy your own chain. So if you want, if you need dedicated throughput, if you're building your own game or something like um, um, that requires high throughput, you might actually need your own blockchain to be deployed. We also offer data solutions such as subgraphs, NFT API, uh, for you to fetch data on a high level because node is pretty low level type of thing. So you cannot do much if you need to get index data, for instance. So you might need to have a high level abstraction on top of the node RPCs that, um, that just been discussed. Um, on, the prior, on the previous talk, right? So we also provide storage, uh, which is pretty cool, um, and it's better than centralized storage solutions. I will explain why uh, briefly. So um, today, honestly, I'm curious to, maybe you have some questions about nodes and infrastructure. I can just talk through them, if you, because I've been doing this for five years, so maybe I have some questions, like some hard questions. If no, I, I, I can give you a bunch of demos and explain like why, um, why what we're building is cool and why, why, is, it, why is it important. So basically, like why, why would you need to use something like that, right? Or in Fuel Alchemy. So basically, uh, you start using you know, Web3 and you buy some ETH and you try to be a true DGN, so you try to put your ETH to your MetaMask wallet or to your non-custodial wallet and then you start using, let's say, MetaMask, and then you can find this in Google by, you know, RPC error MetaMask. You, you start to see all sorts of, you know, errors. It's like internal JSON RPC error, and like, okay, failed transaction, and transaction failed, and error is JS RPC, RPC error with payload, and all these kind of, you know, errors which are weird, and you are not comfortable because it looks like your money is stolen already or <laughs> something. So it's like freaking out. And then it's like, okay, I Google this. Um, and then you find, okay, you probably need to switch your RPC. And then you're like, okay, cool. How do I switch an RPC? You say, okay, you need to go to, you know, some website to fetch RPC endpoints and to choose between them. And then you go to chain list. And then you see, oh, what the fuck is this? And it's like 25,000 URLs. It's like different, like some are red, you know, some are yellow, some are green. It's like, oh, what, so what should I do? It's hell, right? So basically what people, you know, the general you know, sentiment about this, if your RPC doesn't work, you just go and swap it to some other RPC. And basically like people are just spending days, like, you know, it's switching between different RPCs. Probably that's the best investment of your time, right? So this is basically the, what, what people do. Uh, from day to day, they just switch from one RPC to another because uh, they always break. Uh, so what I would recommend to do <laughs> is do not spend your time on that uh, and use something like Chainstack instead. Uh, why is it cool? Because uh, we have a very high reliability. Uh, we have pretty cool status page. You can subscribe and updates. Um, so basically you see mostly green here. Of course, there are some red and yellow from time to time but uh, it's mostly 99.99 uptime or higher. Uh, most of the services are like 100% uptime. For instance, Ethereum, it's pretty sick. Uh, and the first is obviously hosted in GCP. And some are hosted in another providers as well. So basically, uh, we provide like high reliable service for those who want to access blockchain, read, write across all these networks that I just mentioned. Uh, so you can choose the location of your node, right, which is pretty cool. So you can say, okay, I want a node in Singapore. Let's say, for instance, I, Eugene, I actually use this node for my MetaMask uh, or whatever other wallet that I use. I use Frame. I recommend everybody use Frame. Frame is cool. Um, it's a desktop wallet. Um, so basically, you can see, you know, my request here. It's probably uh, all, all transactions that have been sandwiched by, um, by some other people. Joke. So basically, you can see the you know the charts and like how many transactions we've made. Uh, you can see like the response code as you see all uh, successful 200. Zero. You can see the breakdown between different methods you do. Um, and why it's cool that this node is in Singapore because I have the minimal response time. If you use Infura Alchemy, you would have I I did some benchmarks and it's roughly like 16x slower than using this node because this node is literally hosted somewhere in this building probably or <laughs> nearby. Uh, so we can do some latency tests if you have time, but uh, basically this is cool because you can you know, select your location of the node and we support a lot of different locations, like six, six different hosting providers, more than 11 data centers for all these protocols. 
Um, but if you don't want to care about this, recently we, re we released a service called Global Elastic Nodes, which basically gives you a global load balancer. And then wherever you access this node from, it will give you the least response time, uh, which is very cool. And it's even more reliable. So if on regional Elastic Nodes we have four nines, um, then this is always 100% re like, re reliable because you basically combine multiple data centers from multiple providers, including our own provider called Chainstack Cloud that we shipped uh, like a year ago, and it's a purpose-built cloud for blockchain workloads. Um, so basically, this will allow you to, uh, to get the least latency from wherever you are in the world. So you go for a conference, uh, you go you know, for vacation, and you always get the least uh, latency and response time because Basically, you are um, uh, you are getting load balance between different nodes in different locations by us. Um, what's also so what what can you do? This looks like not very friendly for you know end user. So of course you can use the endpoints in MetaMask. Uh, all these people that I mentioned are using uh, you know obviously they are not using it for MetaMask. They're using for all sorts of things like index wallets for you know portfolio tracking or you know, getting some recent like token prices or like indexing data or like you know providing uh, people ability to swap tokens or whatever, right? Or you know, building Oracle solutions or bridging solutions. Uh, so these are all developers, right? But what can, what can you also do as a user, which is, I think pretty cool. Um, I'm not downloading oh, see it's like I just ran it like 15 minutes ago and it's almost Complete. So, for instance, there is a cool project that you might be interested in called TrueBlocks. Um, so, basically, it's a piece of open source software uh, that allows you to index locally uh, any blockchain um, according to the wallets that you're interested in. For instance, you have a wallet uh, and you're a DGEN, so you do like 5,000 transactions per day, and then you also need to fill in taxes. So how do you feel in taxes on all this DGEN stuff that you do every day, right? So basically you need to have some either like out of the box tax solution that will index all your transactions on your wallets, or maybe you need to have something like that, which is basically open source tool to allow you to get, you know, blockchain data um, by like in inserting your endpoint from Chainstack, for instance, copy pasting it into this tool, and then it can help you to, you know, index data which is related to your wallet. So basically all the balances, historical, all the transactions. So you can do very accurate reconciliation to very, very like, you know, high precision. You can see all this transaction in the local explorer. Uh, you can do it for multiple chains as well. And it's all open source and you don't need to, you know, rely. You can actually use this tool with, you know, local node, which you can set up yourself. So this is a very cool tool. Um, uh, the guy is very passionate, uh, the builder, and it's a very cool one because basically if you access the node through RPC, you cannot get really, you know, useful, say, uh, data because you need to be a developer, pretty hardcore one, to be able to make sense of RPC. So if you want to have something more, you know, easy to use and friendlier and like, you know, export your transactions in CSV or something like that, decode it. This is something that you could use, which is pretty cool. I just ran, uh, you know, the protocol. Oh, wow, this is really cool. It's just finished. So basically, uh, this tool is super cool because the guy is like a decentralization maxi. So he builds everything on distributed or decentralized technologies. So in this case, I've been downloading some, you know, Bloom filter indexes from IPFS. Um, um, so I used also Chainstack IPFS gateway to access this data and. What I can do now, uh, we can try, I actually never use this tool. Um, so I was, I was actually curious to use this tool um, for this demo. So this is my wallet. Um, I'm not very rich, as you see. Uh, so unfortunately, so I'm not, a, we are not a unicorn yet. Um, Rafi need to help me with this and he's still lagging behind. So, um, so let's say I wanted to, I wanted to try using this tool to basically export all my transactions related to my wallet. I actually don't know it, whether it would work or not, but let's see. Unknown command. Uh, okay, so probably should do something like export. Oh, wow. So it works. So basically we're downloading, like it, it basically selects the blocks it needs to download from, uh, you know, distributed storage. Uh, which corresponds to the transactions from my wallet so that it can build a local index based on my account. So it's, it's my personal index. 
it just belongs to me. Nobody else has this index. So I honestly have no idea how much would it take. Hopefully not too much because it's used uh, IPFS and extremely fast nodes from ChainStack. Uh, but maybe we can get back to it later and see whether it does something or not. So, so nodes are cool, um, but nodes are very low level. And uh, of course, developers know what to do with nodes. And you all use nodes in the wallets. But what else you can do with, uh, you know, with what kind of web, what kind of other web three tools you might leverage on ChainStack and in general? So there's this cool thing called uh, subgraphs. Uh, who out of you know what is the graph? Anybody knows the graph? Okay, cool. So basically, there's this uh, thing called the graph, which is basically a global indexer thing uh, that you can use to index your applications. So it's application-specific indexer. So for instance, Lido. Uh, which you, you all know, uh, which is a liquid staking solution. Lido has a bunch of contracts on chain. And let's say if you want to do some you know, stats on front end for Lido, you, you want to index the data. And the graph was the first solution um, on, at scale that allows you to index the data on the blockchain and access it. Um, they also have a decentralized network, uh, which is basically just starting because they just start onboarding the graphs uh, from other networks and they basically onboard the new indexer so that it works, but you can also use it in a centralized fashion like with Chainstack, which will give you, you know, SLAs, support, and all this kind of stuff. So in this case, I just like went to um, Lido Finance GitHub, which is again, fully open source. And there's this code for subgraph here, right? There's this definition, like how to index data, and like where to start from, and like which events to, you know, to index and so on and so forth. So basically this is based on your smart contract definition and it allows you to index smart contract specific events. Uh, so what we do here, uh, basically we they take the subgraph and index it uh, on the platform. Um, so it's still indexing, I just uploaded it half, uh, half an hour ago because the live demos, F FTW. Um, so basically uh, you can see also all sorts of stats here and like commands how to deploy and query, and let's say after you, uh, st after you deploy it and it's, st it's still syncing um, and it's still indexing, you can you know, run some queries here. Like this is a query which basically gives you, you know, total rewards from staking on Lido, right? Uh, on each block in the history, which is pretty cool. And you cannot really do it with a node because with a node you will have to, you know, fetch it in, in your, you will need to write a script and you will need to probably like fetch this data and store it locally on some MySQL or PostgreSQL. And basically what the graph does and what our solution does, it basically allows you to index the you know, uh, smart contract specific data and depth specific data and then consume it in a very easy way, which is GraphQL. So subgraphs are pretty cool. Uh, also shout out to our developer experience team. We have very sick documentation. If you go to docschains.com, you can find this section called Web3 Decoded. And if you're a, not just DGEN, but also a uh, dev, uh, you might want to look into all these tutorials. We have like, I know, hundreds of tutorials probably for each product, uh, for, you know, for different protocols, for subgraphs. Uh, I think there's, yeah, I think there's a tutorial for Lido as well, on like how to, you know, how to use the Lido subgraph and how to build it and how to query it and all this kind of stuff. How to index Uniswap data with subgraphs. It's pretty cool. Um, there are all sorts of guys here. Um, so docs are, are nice. Another thing uh, that we released is IPFS storage. So what's IPFS storage? It's basically Google Cloud Storage, but better, okay? Um, so why it's better? I will show you a simple trick, which Google Cloud Storage can never do because it's centralized storage and this is distributed storage. Uh, so basically, uh, this is our solution to um, store and pin files to IPFS. I don't know how, how many of you know what IPFS is. Okay, so TLDR, IPFS is like a BitTorrent, but for files. So it basically uh, ma manages the um, uh, hash table. So basically it takes a hash of a file and basically puts it on a table. And then you can basically address this file by this unique hash, which is basically unique to this file. And then you can uh, access this file from whatever gateway that basically has read um, uh, capabilities from this network, so it's pretty cool. So why it is better? So in this case, this file is pinned on uh, our uh, gateway, and you can access it through our gateway. Uh, so you can, you can basically open the file, um, and it's just some PDF with some you know, 
market overview of Web3. Um, and it might load or not. Uh, it's loading. So, um, so this is the file I uploaded to IPFS, which is stored on, uh, we store it on store J. You probably heard of this store J. Uh, so basically store J is a, is a dis 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 distributed storage solution and it's being addressed by IPFS. So why it's cool, why it's better? Because this is basically the hash, it's called CID, uh, of this particular object, which is this PDF file with, you know, report on, you know, from chain analysis. So what you can do, which is, which is cool, you can basically take this hash and go to some other gateway. So you don't have to trust ChainStack or you don't have to, you know, be sure that ChainStack is up and running, which it is, but it might go down as well. So you basically say, um, there's a bunch of gateways. So I, I use uh, Cloudflare gateway in this example. So Cloudflare has a IPFS gateway. It's called Cloudflare uh, IPFS.com. And uh, then I do IPFS and then I paste the hash. Uh, and it will load the same PDF, which is magic, right? Amazing. <laughs> same report. Amazing, right? So Google Cloud Storage cannot do that, even though it's amazing a storage solution, but this trick is very simple. So you, and you, you have like hundreds of these gateways that you can access this, this file from, which is pretty cool. Um, so I think that's all what I wanted to share. So I highly recommend you to register on Chainstack. Um, um, there's this QR code thing, which I generated in Chrome uh, from Google. <laughs> um, but honestly, it's just chainstack.com and then you click some button like register and then just go and register. So you don't really need to scan this, but um, Anyway, right. organizers are old fashioned, so they asked me to, you know, uh, prepare some QR code. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have any questions about the stuff or nodes or storage or whatever, I'm uh, happy to, you know, chat and share. Yes, Rafi? What do you charge for the developer plan? Oh, yeah, that, uh, that's actually uh, the, the one thing that I want to mention. Um, basically, what is cool about Chainstack, and we're talking about pricing. Uh, don't use alchemy if you want to run in, in production, okay? I just warn you, I warn you once, uh, and I want to explain you why. Um, so if you go on our website and click somewhere, uh, you will get to this page, which has a basically a calculator uh, of your costs if you actually run something in production. So for instance, if you use true blocks and you want to index your uh, account, you would need an archive node and archive nodes are very expensive on all other providers except for Chainstack. Um, so for instance, in this case, I'm using the IPR method called trace block, and I'm doing just 100 million requests per month, which is not that much if you index the whole chain. So if you do this on Alchemy, you'll pay uh, 2.5K per month. If you do it on Chainstack, you, you pay 600K. Um, so you see the difference is pretty big. You can get to, you know, other, you know, get logs is pretty popular call, and let's say we use full node, so let's add it to estimate. Uh, so you see, <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? Uh, and it's true pricing. You can check it out, it's, it's online, you can, you can check your, the pricing yourself, uh, but if you're just starting, then you have everything for free, three million calls per month, which is a very generous quota. You have this global elastic full nodes that I just shown, which are load balanced across the world, which are absolutely free for three million calls. Um, you have regional nodes, which is which means that you can do like you know Singapore node um, subgraphs. You can actually run subgraphs on the free plan as well. Um, yeah, I mean it's free. Free is always good, but uh, what's more important is that when you actually start you know running something important, uh, you don't you know ruin your business by overpaying. Uh, some other providers like Alchemy or maybe Quickno. Okay, Alchemy is actually quite good if you <laughs> because if you compare this price to Alchemy, let's say Trace Block, hundred million per month, right? Let's see what it will. Uh, what will? Okay, it's not so bad actually. See, what about if we do like five hundred million? It's not so bad. See, Quickno is cheaper than Chainstack in this case. Wow. Ah, it's full node. Wait. So what about archive node? Okay, so it's impressive. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you decide. We have all these tools online. You can always check it out. Um, so, uh, again, you feel free to start with any platform. Uh, they all have different, you know, advantages, disadvantages, of course. Uh, but I just tell you when you scale, 
please be careful uh, because when you start using alchemy, it all sounds amazing and free forever and whatever. And then when you start scaling, you have a bill for like 2K in like three days and then you, you know, run out of business. So basically, yeah, it's very important and one of our key differentiators that we basically be very transparent with developers on pricing. Um, so yeah, feel free to start uh, for free, of course. Any other questions, guys? Yes. Maybe for on the consumer side, right? Uh, the most common use case that we we'll use uh, RPC endpoints for be say uh, speed of cleaning, claiming airdrops, right? Yes. In this particular use case, would transaction speed uh, always be fastest if you have your own little private node, uh, irrespective of whatever hardware it is? Um, no. Of course not, uh, because hardware influences a lot, uh, you know, uh, sync speed and, and transaction distribution speed and so on and so forth. So uh, that's why it's important to also, you know, uh, use services that are run by professionals because they know how to optimize what to optimize. Because, I mean, I, if, you, if you go and run the node yourself for these purposes, uh, you start, you know, I don't know, running Geth. Um, I don't know, maybe I have Geth. Uh, but my point is that, oh, wow. So this thing did something, look. I, I mean, I don't know what it is, but there is some transfers probably or something. I mean, I, I literally never, but it works, which is cool. So basically it's a lot of data you can probably export. You see there are some timestamps of my transactions and such. So it's like, it's like a local version of either scan, pretty much. Okay, so you don't have to trust either scan to get uh, your, you know, your own, um, to, to get to know your own business. So basically, if you run Go Ethereum, which is the most popular uh, client, right? Do I have it? I have it. So, so basically, you need to know all this, all this shit. You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, literally, you need to, you know, know what to put in different, you know, parameters. Yeah, of course, if you just run Geth, it would work, but it doesn't necessarily give you the best, you know, performance. And you know, you know, you need to know all this, like parameters, which is super boring. I mean, for me as a consumer, for instance. So I would always use something managed. Um, so uh, another advantage for airdrops and, and other DGEN stuff is that all these public RPCs are overloaded and rate limiting you, right? So if you use any of these public en endpoints, you have like thousands of other people using the same endpoints. So you would never have any competitive advantage on that. Um, also speed wise, again, you want to use something that is closer to you because milliseconds matter, right? Um, what's, uh, uh, what's, what was mentioned in the prior presentation as well about blocks route and such, we have this uh, feature called warp transactions, which is basically the integration of blocks route, which uh, basically allows you to distribute transactions even faster than with your private node, because uh, there's this, you know, the, the thing called CDN in Web2. So in Web3, there is this thing called BDN that this guy's coined. Uh, which is called like blockchain distribution network. So basically, they run like a lot of P2P, you know, complex stuff and allow you to basically distribute your transaction through their, you know, uh, P2P network, which is faster than, you know, a standard P2P network for uh, the blockchains. So basically, for us, we wrapped it up in a feature that is big, super transparent to you. So you, you basically copy the endpoint, you put it to your wallet, and it just works as a normal endpoint, but it will send the transaction to both the node as well as the uh, uh, BDN, and you get the fastest transaction uh, replication on top of on these three networks uh, that we started with. So, so yeah, I mean, this, this is pretty complex thing under the hood. So um, if you just want something that works uh, and works faster than you know, your own node um, for transaction distribution or you know, public endpoints, you would probably want to use something like that. And we have a lot of traders leveraging this. Um, so from yeah, from um, from the consumer standpoint, our, our largest use case is probably like guys who are using this for MetaMask and stuff, uh, but also for trading, right? So we have a bunch of firms um, in Singapore that are using the platform just because we can run nodes for them in Singapore, for instance, or in Tokyo and other regions. Um, but uh, we have a, a case study for traders on the website if you are keen uh, to, to look at it. There are some res recipes on like what other solutions that we provide are cool for, for trading and drops and all sorts of DGN stuff. Um, so yeah, you can just look it up and it, it talks about uh, uh, blocks route uh, and such and such. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yes? For your IPFS storage, do you use it? Uh more recommended for temporary storage 
but we have a long term like the like like PowerPoint, like how so are we? Yeah. Um, Filecoin is not long-term storage, in, in fact. Uh, it basically, you book some storage on Filecoin, uh, and this will basically be stored on a, on a storage provider, but then you need to renew the um, allocation. So uh, by design, it, it basically you just uh, have a claim for some storage, but this claim is not infinite, so you have to renew it generally speaking. So, so Filecoin is not a permanent storage. Arweave is permanent storage. So now IPFS is basically just torrent system, sort of, but for files. Uh, so it's it also important where you store the files. But what's cool for IPFS is that you have this unique, uh, you know, CID um, addressing format, which means that basically if at least one node in the world, which is in the IPFS network, has this file, you can always access the file. Um, but you should. Uh, the downside of the system is that you should still care to some extent on who is storing this file. Because if zero nodes store the file and you still have a CID, it's gone, right? And then if you have this unique file that you know nobody can restore and such, it's gone forever because nobody stores the file. So the downside of IPFS is just basically it's just a you know index of files with some in some hash table. Um, so for instance, for us, it was critical to store it on some, some somewhere that is permanent enough. So that's why we chose store J because we don't need to renew claims for storage and all this kind of stuff from IPFS on I, uh, or from Filecoin. But on Filecoin, this problem is also solvable because they now have this Filecoin FEM, which is like smart contract on top of Filecoin. And there, basically, the primary use case is that you basically uh, create a smart contract that will implement this um, you know, consequent claims for storage. And you say, OK, I want to store this file perpetually for like 20 years. And then you basically send money to a smart contract, and then it will do all the claim, all the claims and renewals and all this kind of stuff. So it's solvable, but out of the box, it's not giving you permanent storage. Arweave is cool. Um, so if you do, I don't know, NFT, I would probably store it on Arweave. I did a bunch of NFT collections on Solana just for fun, and I stored files on Arweave because it's it's truly permanent storage. The downside of Arweave is that it's very um, limited. You cannot store you know, backups of your servers of Arweave. It's impossible. Uh, so if you need to store something valuable but small, Arweave is the best. Um, otherwise, you know there are a bunch of solutions like StoreJ with or without IPFS, Filecoin, and all this kind of stuff. So you are using a node provider, and then very recently they, they stopped support for one of the, the chain that they're using. So it's very disruptive. So I want to ask that: What's your your policy towards continuity of service? So that so like, thank you, you know, that would, would, would it be a case that maybe we stop support one of the other chains? Uh, that's an amazing question, honestly. Um, so we recently considered deprecating a chain. Um, so that's a very timely question. Uh, we went through this. So uh, the chain was Harmony. Anybody knows Harmony? Okay, so Harmony was a pretty cool chain at some point until they got hacked uh, for one million and got uh, almost bankrupt. So basically, uh, we were supporting Harmony since the beginning, and we were basically facing this dilemma on like, okay, so we have very limited traction on Harmony, honestly, um, nowadays. So the, the, there's a lot of attention which is being stolen by other chains for obvious reasons. We also ran public endpoints for Harmony, which was funded by the uh, foundation. We stopped them because for us, it's free endpoints. If they're not funded by anybody, there's no you know, value for us as a business to run them. But we kept the platform offering. Why? For this particular reason, because there are people like you, and maybe there are not so many people in the world who are using Harmony on Chainstack. Maybe there are just hundreds, but they're still using Harmony on Chainstack. So they're running an application on Harmony, and we want to support the builders um, so we kept the offering. Why? Because uh, because of our you know hosting facilities that are very diverse, um, which we can basically select. Okay, we run on some you know cheap cloud, so we don't have to you know pay a lot for the infrastructure to maintain Harmony on Chainstack. So we can choose some you know bare metal solution, something like that, to run it for you know some nominal price per month, and still you know and maybe break even on this, so not make money out of this protocol, be break even because we run it for very low cost and we still have some usage from the customers. But because we want to you know, keep people 
you know, safe and, you know, want, want them to have some continuity so that we don't, you know, deprecate chains every month or something like that. But it's a very interesting question because indeed, I think, I mean, I will probably look at this website in like five years and probably, the, you know, this chains will be completely different. So now it's very early and I think that, uh, of course, not all the chains will survive. The problem with, you know, chains is that it's some sort of permanent thing. Because usually chains are not halted, they are just slowly dying. And it can take like literally tens of years, I think. Uh, because if there is at least, like, you know, one application running and like a bunch of node validators who still want to support the network, it will be running. So I don't know, think about EOS. Is anybody using EOS? It's like, for me, it's a completely dead network, honestly. I mean, it's just nothing happens there. I uh, actually tried to use it out of curiosity, it was all broken. Uh, but the point is that nobody's using EOS, but it's still, you know, it's still running. There is an explorer, there is a chain, and there are still probably people, you know, even maybe building applications on EOS. So as a service provider, you want to have some continuity and not like deprecate services. So, so, we, so we had this, you know, process um, recently where we considered deprecating a protocol, but then uh, decided to keep it uh, because we want to, you know, offer this continuity for our customers. Oh, by the way, the, the chain question is about coin. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to continue supporting Filecoin? A Filecoin FEM, you mean? Or? Yeah, the Filecoin. Yeah, we, we, we like Filecoin, so we'll, we'll continue supporting it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give me a code. <laughs> of course. I mean, you can start for free also. So you can, okay. you can register. I mean, you can just go on, on, on free plan. Is your cost comparison table? Uh, who else which other provider does you compare? Well, I mean, we compare with Quicknode and Alchemy because they are our major, you know, competitors. Um, and for Filecoin, I think uh, there are there is Glyph, which is some sort of Filecoin specific provider, I guess. And there is not much other providers on Filecoin. I think we are kind of the only Anchor, Anchor probably provides. Yeah, yeah. So Anchor and Glyph, I, I think, yeah. So. Mm. So yeah, Filecoin we support, we, we don't have any plans to, you know, deprecate it or whatnot. Because some chains are very early and um, you never know because they, you may support them for one year, nothing happens, and then in one year it suddenly, you know, st starts to break out. So that's the benefit of supporting chains early and that's also a downside because you kind of, you know, need to believe in the chain. So I know I kind of like Filecoin personally, so that's why we supported it in the first place. Um, because I also, I, my background is in, you know, traditional cloud computing, so I think that distributed storage is cool, um, so I want to support. You guys have too many questions to me, and we need to talk about staking at home, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. So. Um, very excited to be here once again to share with you guys yet another edition of how to be a home sticker, how to get started. So for those of you who don't already know me, I help people get started uh, to set up their own home-based Ethereum validator node um, by setting up and operating nodes for them and providing knowledge transfers over time. In doing so, I am building a grassroots community of solo node operators here in Southeast Asia beginning from my home ground, Singapore, and then Malaysia first. So, um, thanks to our friends here at Google Cloud, right? It has become very easy and free to get started and to practice in order to build confidence and then eventually put real ETH into your own setup. So, um, what I'm going to do here, right, is this will serve as kind of like a sneak preview to what to expect during my workshop. And it will be a little bit of a speed run, but uh, don't worry about like all the commands that I'm about to type one by one, right? Just try to understand the concepts behind uh, each major step. So just, gi just give me a sec. I I'm having trouble navigating this in this. <laughs> give me a sec, guys. Okay, so guys, so the way I'm gonna do this, right, is by referencing a walkthrough guide that I've put together for my workshop. So um, I'm just going to be like copy pasting a, a bunch of our commands, right? According to each major step. And you can think of these like, commands as like uh, scripts that I'll run to fulfill a, a certain concept. So without further ado, the first thing that we have to do, right, is just head over to Google Cloud. 
on your browser. And what you'll see, right, is just kind of the first uh, search option. And then you'll see this, like, $300 in free credits for new customers. And for customers who verify their business email, you'll get an additional $300 of free credits, so 600 in total. So I've already signed up for this, but for anyone, any individual, don't even have to be like a business, right? You can just go and sign up, uh, log in, and then you head on to go to console. So what a validator node in essence, it is in essence, right? It's basically a computer, yeah? And what we're gonna do here is to host this computer on the cloud, which is a server. In Google Cloud terms, it's called a virtual machine. So let's go on and, and click on this uh, create a VM button. Just wait for it to load. And then you, you see this option here, right? This is just to name your validator node. I will just call it test node. And then we'll select a machine with a 16 GB of RAM. Then we'll select our OS to be you can use any Debian based uh, OS, but uh, I like to use Ubuntu. Have at least 500 GB of storage. And then let's go ahead and select the latest AMD 64 version of Ubuntu and then select. So on the right hand side column here, you can see that the monthly estimated cost will be around $148 um, or equivalent to 20 cents per hour, which means that you have effectively 60 to 120 days to practice for free. So let's go ahead and now create this virtual machine, which will act as our validator node. Oops. Let's go. Oops. To FA. Give me a sec. Best practice, yes. <laughs> yes, it's me. Right, 90. All right. So now that it's loading, um, what we need to do now, right, is to create a way for us to log in into our validator node. And in practice, a very secure way to do this, right, would be via the SSH key pass method, which means we need to generate this SSH key pair now. And I would do, usually you would generate this on your working laptop, but uh, for the purpose of this demo, I'll just go ahead and use the Google Cloud Console on this platform to simulate this uh, working laptop. So let's just wait for it to fire up. Okay, so the validator node is up and running now. And then we have our console active. All right, so let's now generate our SSH key pair using, you can use basically any algorithm, but I just like to use this ED255191 and then just tag it with whatever email address you want. This is just to identify your key pair. Okay, right, yes. And then you, you need to enter a password to encrypt your SSH private key and then boom, it's, it's generated. So now uh, SSH key pairs are generated. You need to copy the public key into your validator node. Oops. All right, so copy this string of text here. All right, is it better? Let's copy. Copy, and then go enter into your uh, virtual machine, and then let's paste it into the SSH settings. So let's search for SSH. Under SSH keys, you will find, sorry, sorry, you need to edit first. Yeah. All right, SSH. So add item, paste it here, and then save. So while well, that's loading, let's go and find our IP address. Uh, no, we gotta wait for it to load. All right, I think it's done. Okay, so now we will log in into our validator node before we can start setting up. 
So let's go ahead and go with SSH. You can see. Oh, you can't see. Sorry, sorry. Right. So let me just run this again. So let's go ahead and start SSHing. Um, okay. Right, boom, boom, boom. Okay, yes. And then we have to key in our password to decrypt the private key. And we are in. So now you can see. Can you see actually? You can't. You can't. Oh. Okay, give, give, give me a sec, guys. Okay. Oh, interesting. Seems like some limitations. Okay, let's, let's do it this way. Yeah? <laughs> so now you can see it says like Sam at test node. It means I've logged in on, into test node, which is the name I, I gave my validator node earlier. So once you're in your validator node, the first thing you have to do, right, is to make sure that all your packages and dependencies are up to date before we start installing uh, the, the validator software. So let's go ahead and run this very short uh, command. All right. And while it's waiting to run, right, the next major step will be to secure your validator node. And we'll do this via a very simple implementation of uh, firewall rules. Um, so you can see by default, it denies incoming traffic. By default, it allows outgoing traffic. And then um, for incoming traffic, you will also allow port 22, port 30,303, and uh, port 9,000. This is just so that you are able to act remotely access a validator node. Uh, the GAF client, the execution layer client, is able to reach other nodes, and then the consensus layer client can do so, uh, do the same. All right, so let's go ahead and paste this. All right, yes. All right, and we are done. So the summary output, as you can see here, uh, describes what is uh, keyed in earlier. So once that is done, we can now proceed to generate our validator keys itself. So this step in practice right, needs to be highly secure. So you will usually generate your private keys in an air gap machine, which means a, a device that has never been connected to the internet before. Yeah? Um, it, it might seem complicated, but there's actually a very quick uh, and easy way to like, uh, uh, stimulate this. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm just gonna go ahead and generate the private keys on the validator node itself um, because it's testnet and it's demo, right? So let me just show you how it'll look like. Basically, you go to this uh, GitHub repository. Whoa, what's this? Account recovery, really? Right, so basically you go to the GitHub repository, find the latest version that is applicable to your OS. For me, it will be Linux AMD 64. Uh, download it and then extract it and then run it. So basically this is what the, uh, the batch of commands is doing here. So let's go ahead and run it. You know what, let me just do this too. Okay. Same level. All right. Now that we've uh, downloaded and extracted the file, we will run the deposit, uh, sorry, the uh, validator key generation command itself. Okay, boom. And then we will just follow the instructions shown on this interface, right? So please choose your language. Let's go ahead and select three for English. And then because we are pre-setting our withdrawal Ethereum address, so they just want us to confirm it in case we there's some typo. So copy and paste it. And then the last step, no, actually the third step, is to choose the language of a mnemonic word list. This is basically the language of your seed phrase. So let's go ahead and select four for English. And then a password to encrypt your uh, validator signing keys. So repeat the password, boom. And then you have this list of 24 words that's, that's been generated. This is, I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. This is a seed phrase. In practice, once again, in a highly secure environment, you have to write it down on paper, don't store it online, no matter the circumstance, but I'm just gonna copy this and then paste it for confirmation. So you see this rhinoceros here, it means uh, you've run it correctly, and then you can see that it's creating your keys, verifying your deposit, blah, blah, blah. Success, your keys can be found in this folder. So let's press any key to continue. Now that we've generated our 
validator signing keys, uh, we can now start to install the execution layer and consensus layer clients. But before that, um, we need a way for these two clients to communicate securely with each other, which is why we need to create something called a JSON web token. So let's go ahead and create this now. All right, now done. So now let's download and install the execution layer client, which we'll be using Geth in this example. So let's, let's go back to the main directory, run the script. You can see this progress bar here. Boom, 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 it should be done soon. And it's done. Okay, so now that we've downloaded and installed Geth, we need to uh, configure Geth to run as a background service, which is what these four lines of commands are doing. Let's copy this, paste it. All right, so you open up a blank configuration file and we need to uh, paste this configuration parameters in it. And I'll just go through it on high level, like what this does. Oh, wait. Hold on, hold on. All right. All right, so j just focus your attention on the left-hand panel of the screen. Sorry, right, right for you guys. All right, so basically what we are telling Gav to run as, right, is to run on the girly network, on the girly chain, using this folder as the data directory to store all the chain data when it's syncing. Using this JSON web token file that we generated earlier to communicate securely with the consensus layer, and then enabling metrics for monitoring purposes. So let's go ahead and save this configuration file. And let's zoom out, zoom out. Right. right, now that the configuration file is saved, we will go ahead and fire up the GAF service itself. So boom, boom, boom. Can you guys see this? This green dot here with a, a text called uh, active bracket running in green. It means uh, you have uh, started GAF correctly and it's running smoothly. So this is just like uh, the logs for GAF, right? It's looking for peers, blah, blah, blah. So now we have just have to wait for GAF to sync with the rest of the network. It'll take around like 20 to 22 hours on the Girly test net. So now that GAF is installed, running smoothly, right, we will now proceed to download and install the consensus layer software. So once again, let's just go back to the main directory, paste this batch of commands in, it's downloading, boom, downloaded. So for the consensus layer, uh, Clients, what we an additional step we need to do, right, is to import our validator signing key stores uh, that we generated earlier, so that the validator node, the, the dumb device, right, becomes uh, linked uh, on chain to your uh, thirty-two ETH deposit. So for this one, we need to do some edits. So let's, uh, you know what, let's just do it here. All right. So we need to replace this like key store. Uh, file name with our actual uh, signing keys. So let's go ahead and let's change directory into no sticking. Yes, this. Yep, yep. And then, all right. So your actual signing key store name will be this thing key store dash m blah 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 dot json. And so let's replace this. All right and then we can run this batch of commands. Okay, change directory, run it. All right, done. So your validator keys are now imported. Oh, sorry, sorry, that was just a preparation step. So now we are actually going to import the validator signing keys. All right. Da -da -da. All right, so now you can see you need to enter the key store password that you generated earlier or that you created earlier. And all right. So you will see that your yeah, password is correct, successfully imported key store, successfully updated validators definition.yml, it's basically a configuration file, and successfully imported one validators. And then there's a one big warning to warn you against using the same key source to validate with another client, uh, or you will get slashed via an attestation violation, a double attestation violation. So now that your, your validator keys, uh, signing keys are imported, we will now configure uh, Lighthouse, which is a consensus client that we're using in this demo to run as a background service similar to Geth. So similar steps, as you can see, then copy this uh, configuration parameters in. 
then let's go through with the flags here. Right, so we're instructing Lighthouse to run on the Gurley network using this folder as the data directory, enabling HTTP connection, uh, pointing to this URL, which basically just points to your, your, your GAF endpoint. Um, again, using the JSON web token we generated uh, as a secure way of communicating with the execution layer. Enabling checkpoint sync so that uh, your consensus layer client uh, is able to sync very rapidly, almost instantly, like in just a few minutes with the whole network. And then the same thing as with GAF, we are enabling metrics for monitoring. So let's go ahead and save this. All right. Now we can start. Zoom up, zoom up. All right. Now we can start our the first part of the consensus layer client, which is the beacon node. Boom, boom, boom. Right. So once again, active bracket running in green. It means we are doing something right. All right. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead now to configure part two of our consensus layer client, which is the validator client service itself. All right. And then same thing, you need some parameters, some instructions for the validator client to run. So once again, run on the Gurley network using this same uh, folder as the beacon node uh, service as the, uh, as the data directory to store chain data. This suggested fee recipient basically instructs the validator node client to use this address. It will be any address that you want to designate to receive your MEV rewards. So if, if this address is wrong or there's a typo, right, your MEV rewards, if you have a windfall of say 100 ETH, right, will go to the void. <laughs> so be very careful when you uh, key in the addresses. And then there's a very interesting flag here called graffiti, uh, which is which you can paste any text here. You can type any text here. It is basically used when your validator node proposes a block. Um, and, and whatever graffiti you choose here will be inscribed on chain. So if you want to leave your mark in history, this is a very interesting way to do so. Okay, let's go ahead and save this configuration file. And then once again, run this client as a background service. Right, boom, boom, boom. Active bracket running means we're doing something correctly. Right, then let's exit the monitoring. and. We are done. In less than 30 minutes, we have set up a testnet validator node on Google Cloud. Right? Uh, it's a speed run, of course. So uh, naturally, this is uh, just the first step and it's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of nuances and uh, best practices that I don't have time to go through today, but I will cover in my workshops uh, instead. Um, and of course, it comes with practice uh, to understand what you're doing at each step. But fortunately for us today, you know, we have a lot of free trial credits. You know, I only know about like the $300 and apparently there's like 100K credit <laughs> for small businesses. So very, very promising times, I would say. And I think it's the right time for everyone to treat this as, you know, an emerging trade skill that could be very relevant uh, as we move forward into the future. Because as you can see, it is what is, um, it takes 45 days of queue time right, to be activated uh, in the beacon chain, right? This demand is going to continue growing, right? Especially when the next cycle comes along, right? So as, as demand grows, right, um, uh, if you have this trade skill, you can capture a share of that demand. Sorry, I forgot to mention, the setup is not done. What we have to do is four, four steps as next steps here. Number one, we have to wait for the execution layer client to sync. It'll take around 20 days, eh, sorry, 20 hours on the girly. <laughs> some minority clients can take 20 days on, on some hardware, and don't laugh. So uh, 20 hours on girly uh, testnet, eh, around four to five days on the mainnet. Um, in the meantime, we need to monitor the logs of your system, of your GAF client, of your Lighthouse client for anomalies or error messages, and then troubleshoot as needed. And then once everything is done, all systems green, you'll proceed with the deposit process itself um, using one of the files that we generated earlier, and I'll show you which one it is. Uh, staking something underscore, right? Yep. Yep, it'll be this uh, deposit underscore data blah blah dot JSON file. Basically links your offline machine to a registry on chain so that when you deposit 32 ETH, right, it, it, it knows that it belongs to you. 
Um, so yeah, so that's, once that's done, you got to queue on the beacon chain for the five days, blah, 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 right? And then just wait for your validator to be activated. All right, so um, yeah, so if anyone wants to attend the full workshop, like go through the full process of like two hours for the first day, one hour for the second day, uh, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, thank you for your time and I'll see you around.